Anyway, we are in Ephesians chapter 4. We uh, started this last week, or started this new chapter, and got through part of it. Uh, we are in verse 2. I want to go back to verse 1 and bring us up to speed kind of in verse 2, because there's a list that Paul gives right here to these Christians in these Christian Gentiles in uh, Ephesus. And certainly this is a uh, great motivator for them to, you know, to know how to behave and the conduct that they are to have. And of course, now they understand their background as they read through this letter, you know, and and looking and, you know, I can just see them reminiscing about where they used to be and where they are now. But now Paul's getting into some really specific things. I mean, he was kind of general before saying, hey, you're now you're part of this, you know, Jews and Gentiles are part of this church that, you know, they were kept hearing about. But now uh, he's saying, this is what, you know, now that you're a part of this, this is what is expected of you. And so there was, you know, and this was, these are all characteristics and traits that were not part of who they were before. And so a lot of this, they, you know, that they, they kind of have to shift. That's what we do when we become Christians, isn't it? I mean, we have to shift our thinking. The way that we approach things, the way that we make decisions, the way that we think about certain things, um, everything becomes different. We, you know, and so we uh, we don't do things the way that we used to. And there are new interests and new uh, things that probably challenge our thinking that we might not have thought about before. And that's exactly what was happening with uh, with these Ephesians, as Paul said. But in verse one of chapter four, he says, "I therefore the prisoner." And that, uh, you know, the word prisoner, it's not a negative term. We sometimes think about it in that way, as we looked at. But that word prisoner means just uh, a confinement. And uh, in this context, it's a confinement for the sake of Christ. In other words, he's saying, I am confined, you know, he says, I therefore the prisoner, I'm the confinement of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And so while they were prisoners of the world at one time, prisoners of sin, now they say, we're confined to Christ. We belong to him. And so, you know, we're going to belong to someone or something our entire life. Even people who think, no, I'm in control of my own life and I can do this and this and that or whatever. And uh, we are, you know, we, we are amenable to something. And having Christ there and knowing what the hope is and having them understand this, that now that they're in Christ, there's something so much better and so much more hope. And you know, Paul is able to prove this and reason with them and help them understand what it is. And we can get someone who's out in the world or who's in a different religion to understand that same thing, that if you're in Christ the way the New Testament teaches, if you're in his church, the one that we see in the New Testament, then, you know, think of the hope. But there is that difference. But then once we become that new creature coming up out of the waters of baptism, uh, there are certain there are changes that have to be made in our lives. And there are things that are going to uh, enable us to maintain that relationship with him the way that we need. And so he says, you know, he says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, uh, or, you know, meekness, as uh, some translations were. And uh, we looked at meekness last week. That's actually a characteristic that, you know, that's an adjective for Christ, in a lot of different passages, we know that Christ was very meek, and of course, uh, you know we we know that meek uh, defined as we did last week, you know is, is having the power to do something but being able to hold it back. You know, you think of the power that Jesus had; he was one hundred percent man, but he was also one hundred percent God, wasn't he? And he had, you know, we see that, you know, we sing the song. He could have called ten thousand names. He you know, all he had to do was call one. One was enough. That could have made a bad day for a lot of people, but. He did not do that, and that's meekness. And you see of just who he dealt with and how he dealt with them, and you see all these different, you know, you see the the conflicts that Christ had during his life with different people, the you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the ones that just stood opposed to him, the Roman government, the Jews. You know, he had so many people against him in his life, and he could have easily taking care of any one of them in a, you know, in a day. I mean, just, you know, in one afternoon. But he didn't because there was a message that he was sending and there was a, uh, there was something that he was teaching them. There were lessons that people were learning. And you think of, you know, all these Jews, you know, if he would have done that, 
you know, if he would have wiped out all those Jews that wanted him dead, then you, th- you know, those 3,000 people wouldn't have even been around on Pentecost to follow him and to, you know, to realize that. And Christ is, you know, Christ was always looking forward, wasn't he? He was always, you know, he's always anticipating. And of course, you know, he did have foreknowledge, but at the same time, he knew that, you know, if he, you know, if he, if he didn't destroy people, that there was always a chance for them to come to know him. And what, you know, how great that was when the church was established after he was gone and he knew it, he talked about it, he prophesied about it. Um, he didn't fail in his mission. He knew exactly when the church was going to happen and he knew what had to happen, the circumstances. And so, you know, you look at Pentecost and those 3,000 Jews that just 50 days prior to that were calling for his death on the cross. Now they become, you know, they're the, they're the newest converts. They're the first Christians to this well other than, you know, the apostles. We can uh, assume that they were already there, but it says they were added to, the Lord added them to them, Acts 247. They were, you know, but they were the first Jews that were able to understand just how significant that cross really was when they asked, what should we do? And so how amazing that is, to, you know, when you can see that shift and that just that eye-opening breakthrough moment in, in different people. And so he talks about this meekness that we are to have, um, Paul, and he's, uh, the, you know, doing the same thing and acting the same way that Jesus did. Then he comes to one uh, in this list, which is what we left off with, long-suffering. What is long-suffering? Who has a good definition of that? Patience. That's a good one. Anyone else? That patience is a big part of that. How much patience? We like to think we have you know some kind of patience, right? But this is patience long term. Long suffering is literally when you look at that word, it's to suffer long. That's what that is. That means you know an ongoing. It's not just having. You know, so patience is a good part of that. You need patience with it, but it, it, it extends beyond that when that even when you start to suffer because of something happening, that you do that, you know, over a long period of time. We don't have that today, it, it seems, in a lot of different uh, situations, do we? We're okay, at the, you know, for a little bit, but we all, it's all like we almost give a time limit to how long we, you know, we can endure something or how long we're to go through something. Now, there comes a point when we do need to, cut something off and say, hey, look, this is, you know, if you're not improving by this time, then certain things have to be done. You know, with church, you know, we look at church discipline and uh, there are certain things that the elders have done, certain decisions that the elders have made and never easy decisions and everyone's want to have to make, uh, but there are things that, you know, that you do and they give, you know, and they've given people say, you know, to you know, by this time, but that doesn't mean that we don't still love them and care for them and want them to change and want them to make things right. But you look at long suffering, which is what, you know, and this is one of the main things that Paul talks about with them. I don't know what their, you know, I don't know what their mindset was before this, but there was a reason that Paul told them they have to do this. And my get, you know, whenever you look at something with scripture, and especially when you start looking at lists, it's always, you know, there's a reason why that's in that list. There's something that is affecting them that would make that, you know, that, that would make that necessary to list it in, you know, whatever situation it is. And we see a lot of these different lists. And so you look at these Ephesians and who they were and where they came from and now who they are. And Paul, you know, and, and Paul saying, there's long suffering that you're going to have to do. And you think of these Ephesians and how, you know, Paul needed that long suffering with them, didn't he? Can you imagine if he didn't and he just gave up on them, you know, first time around or just, you know, if you don't want to hear it, then, well, you know, good luck after this life. He stayed with them and he talked with them and he prayed and he just, you know, he talks in several different places about how he prayed for them because he cared about them. And so there's this long suffering that he says that they have to do. Why do we need long suffering, do you think? Okay, who are you know? Who are the people? Who can, can you think of anyone that needs long suffering? Don't name names. I don't want this to become that. I, you know, we're not going to bash on people this morning. But who are the kinds of people that need long suffering? Well, I don't think there's a specific kind that you can put a label on. But uh, individuals, there's all all kinds of long suffering, and when you 
you say after a period of time, I think I don't think you can put a period of time on there because long suffering is when you lose a, a, a mother or a father, you know, that just doesn't go away in you know a year or two years. That to me that's long suffering. And I, what's the worst part is your siblings or parents that are not members of the church. There's long suffering there because you know they're not going to be going to heaven. And so that's a different, and that's a difficult thing right there. It's knowing what their state is and knowing they're getting closer every day. I mean, gets them closer and closer and closer. And uh, do we just give up? Do we just, you know, and like Jim was saying, do we put just a time limit on that? You know, can you imagine just putting it, you know, and saying, hey, what, you know, mom or dad or brother or sister, you know, if you'd, you know, I want you to, you know, I want you to go to heaven, but <laughs> I'm going to give you till now, and then I'm just going to. I, you know, I, I can't do any more. There, you know, there comes time that we need to stop focusing on one thing. Uh, stop focusing on that. It's probably not the right term, but you know, where we need to invest our time and energy into ones who will respond to the gospel. That's not to say don't stop praying for them. But if all I do is try to, you know, is try to uh, keep after, you know, someone who just keeps rejecting it and rejecting it and rejecting it and rejecting it. And someone over here is ready to hear in their great soil. And I'm not giving them the attention because I'm over here getting the same answer over and over and over and over again. I keep praying for them. I, you know, don't stop them by all means, but, you know, try to, you know, we, we only have so much time that we're able to invest, don't we? But long suffering means that you don't ever, you know, that it's, you know, you're suffering long with someone. Um, there are some people that are going to push your buttons, aren't there? How difficult is that? When you start trying to reach them with the gospel or you try to correct something that, the, you know, that might help them, that you see biblically that, they, that might need correction, but they just, you know, but they just push your button. They might, you know, the, and, you know, some just don't like their buttons pushed. They make rash decisions. But with long-suffering done the right way, we can work through things like this. Would that enduring be a good word for it? Yeah, enduring, I mean, it's, uh, enduring has more to do with the next one that's in that list, but certainly enduring uh, has to do with long, I mean, you know, because you have to endure, uh, you know, you're working through it. Enduring has more of what it's doing to you. You're, you know, long suffering is almost offensive. Enduring is almost defensive. If you know, when you start looking at the two of them, but certainly uh, there are aspects of each one that go hand in hand. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. No, you said something interesting because, you know, when we look at long suffering, we say, you know, that it's to suffer long. We, you know, today we tend to think of suffering as what? Which is kind of what Katie, I think, was saying. Pain and, you know, and just misery and 
all of these different things that you know kind of go with the suffering that we instantly do. But that's not what it what, you know. That's not what it, it now. Sometimes it is, but suffering is not just you know all the painful stuff. It can be frustration. We you know we suffer. We can suffer emotionally. We can suffer mentally. We can suffer you know different and different ways that aren't necessarily painful, but it can be frustrating. That's where the patience comes in uh, to play because it is a long term patience that we sometimes need with people. And sometimes it can be spread out for years. I mean, you think of someone who, Doyle, you had something. I'm going to finish right after Doyle said. Well, there's probably not a better example than the Jews and Gentiles for long suffering of how the you know the Jews you know are long suffering. And Paul saw both of them, didn't he? Remember, Paul went to the Jews first, and the Jews didn't listen. He said, "Okay, I'll go to the Gentiles," because the Gentiles needed to hear it just as much as the Jews did. But the Jews didn't want the Gentiles to have any part of what they had, you know. And there was a there was definitely a clash right there, and uh, there was you know long suffering was it was needed for this. I mean, Paul was. You know, when he, I mean, you think of going to, into a pagan society and trying to get them to change. It's not, it, you know, it's never overnight, is it? In fact, there's no one that changes overnight. It's always a process. Now, some processes are longer than other ones. Some are shorter, but that's what it is. You know, what you think of someone who's just spent their whole life outside of Christ, and then when they're 70, 80 years old, you know, have you ever seen someone that was an older person that was baptized that just thought, Wow, all this time, all these years, what a, you know, how interesting that is. You think what, you know, after, you know, 70 years, and, you know, I've talked about, uh, you know, I've talked about uh, Buddy that I studied with for, you know, months and months. And uh, finally he was in his 70s when he, he, you know, when he got baptized. What triggers, you know, just something inside their head that says, wow, I, you know, this, I'm not where I need to be. All this time, I thought I had a handle on. All this time, I thought I was safe and, un- and I understood, and I thought I could just be a good person and just be nice to people. And now, after all this time, the Bible's been around all that time. They've had access to the Bible all that time. But then it's just that, you know, just that one study that you have with them or that series of studies that you might have with them. You know, that's, uh, you know, that you think patience is what you, know, what you need. Think of what Paul went through. When he was trying to get, he didn't convert these people overnight. When we read this, this was a lot of time spent with trying to get them to understand where they were and why that wasn't going to work for them. Because these people were embedded in that false worship. There are people that are embedded in false religions all over the place, and some of them for a long, long time. And they're invested in the church. You know, we sometimes think, well, a person's a you know, they, can't, they haven't been in it that long because religion hasn't been around that long. But they, you know, they spend their whole life in it, though. You know, they're, not everyone is going to be that Catholic that, you know, seldom goes to church except for once a year. Or that person that just comes to worship on, you know, on Easter or Mother's Day or Christmas or whatever it is because they think, oh, I've got to do it this one time to feel religious in some sense. And they want more of a religious experience than uh, to worship God. Um. Not everyone's going to be like that. Some people are going to be really dedicated to their faith, and they have, you know, and they have active roles wherever they go. And those are the ones that are really tough to get to, re, you know, to start rethinking everything. Well, what do we do? Do we just say, well, you know, hopefully they'll eventually do it? Okay, I'll just try to plant the seed. That's how a lot of people do it. They just, you know, they go in, they try to have, they have one religious discussion with them. They come back and they say, well, I planted the seed. What they do with it, uh, you know, is up to them. Is that really long suffering? 
If you really care about that person and you really sincerely want them to get to heaven and you know them, why does it stop at just one conversation feeling just satisfied that, oh, well, that's it. Now, you hope that seed gets planted enough to, you know, that someone else might be able to water it if you're not the one because there are seed planters and there are waterers. You hope they get far enough to where the Lord can add them to the church. But, you know, we need to do everything that we possibly can if we want. I mean, Paul, you know, these were people that Paul didn't even know. And yet he cared about them enough that he would go the distance with them. But there are people out there that, you know, they make rash decisions. With long suffering, you know, we, you know, we can work through it. It means we can't be hasty, can we? Not ending things with that. You know, you look at, uh, you know, in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.2, he tells him, Timothy, preach the word and be instant in season when everything's going well, right? We love in season. It's easy for us to reach people in season because they, come, you know, a lot of times they come to us. Isn't that great? You ever had someone that just came to you and said, hey, tell me about the Bible. You know, they start asking questions and they really want to know and you have that Bible study and it couldn't go any, it couldn't go any smoother because they are where you are coming to you and you just think, wow, how easy is this? I love evangelism, right? But with that in season comes also what? Out of season, what's out of season? Oh, that changes everything, doesn't it? We don't like out of season because out of season pulls us out of you know, our comfort zone. Out of season means that I'm going to have to do some work. I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to, have to do that long suffering. And that long suffering might not just be frustrating for them. It's going to be frustrating for me because I'm going to have to keep, you know, I, I'm going to be the one that has to field all these different questions or push back or, you know, some, sometimes people want to argue. They just don't agree. And they just, you know, and you just think, you know, why are they not agreeing with me? And I just, you know, when we get defensive and that's out of season. Well, we can, when we can put the Bible as the authority, that's where we're gonna. That's where we're gonna make the difference, you know. But you know, there are some who just will listen to whoever's talking to them. They trust you. They like you. They do. But I can't get anyone to heaven. I don't have that power. I don't have that authority. That's why we need to really. We get, we need to get people into the Word of God. We need to get them into the Bible and seeing what the Bible has to say and looking at those in the New Testament. Well, what made, you know, what saved them? What made them have their sins washed away? And then get them to understand, that, well, I got to do the same thing. If I want the same results as they do, why, you know, I need to do the same thing they did. Then I'll be added to the very same church that they, you know, that they were added to in the New Testament. It's not a different church every, you know, every generation. Not in, you know, it's, it's not the church every time that, you know, some new church comes out. There's only one that we see that's the authentic, original church. Everything else is just, you know, they're counterfeits. There's something wrong with them because they're not the original one that we see in the New Testament. But, you know, we, that, you know, when he told Timothy to preach, you know, to be ready in season and out of season, very seldom do we really think we're going to be in a situation where it's out of season. And then when we come to it, how do we, how do we respond to it? That's tough, isn't it? If we're not ready, the way he tells Timothy to be ready. And that's, you know, and when, you, when, when you're ready, that helps, you know, as he says, to convince and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and teaching because there is going to be that out of season Paul had that out of season with the, with the Ephesians, but that's what we do. Just because someone does not respond immediately doesn't mean they're not going to change, and it doesn't mean that there's, there's no hope for them. And there are people even, you know, and not just outside of the church. Do we need to be long-suffering with people inside the church? Boy, that's where it gets really frustrating, doesn't it? Well, this is my brethren, and this is what Paul's telling them. He's saying you'd be loving towards one another, you'd be long-suffering towards one another, and he's talking to a bunch of Christians right here. 
think of what that, you know, think of those cases. Because we have a lot of personalities in the church, don't we? And a lot of them clash. We don't always have the same, you know, we, we have, you know, there are type A personalities in the church, aren't there? Type A personalities don't, you know, some people just cannot, it's hard to get along with a type A personality. And when I say, what, what is a type A personality for those who don't know? They what? High achiever. High achiever. They what? Strong willed. What else? They take charge. They take charge. They're always, you know, sometimes they, and they're looked at sometimes as overbearing. They, you know, they want, they know what they want. They're, you know, they are, uh, they, you know, they are, you know, they, they try to push that sometimes on others. And not everyone likes that kind of personality because it's a strong personality. And so we have those personalities. And then we have other ones that are just passive. And then we have the passive aggressive ones. And then we have all these different kinds of personalities that make up the, you know, the church. And then you get it into a congregation where we get even, you know, we get even more intimate and we know each other. Do all the personalities necessarily harmonize with one another in a congregation? Oh, no. So what do we do about it? What, what do we do when something like that happens, when our personalities clash with each other? Well, one thing is, uh, is a lot of us probably in our employment years all went through those assessments, just what you're talking about. Companies made big money that would put you in this category of who you are. You're a follower or you're, you know, you're the leader. And uh, they spent big money on that. <coughs> Okay, I think that's good. You nailed something. I think when you said, you know, when people come in through those doors, they're, you know, you're, you're different. Our personalities are going to stay with us, aren't we? It is really tough. I mean, you can talk to someone and you can let them know, hey, I, you know, I, you know, I don't appreciate or hurt or it's, you know, it's, there's something you said that upset me and have that conversation with them. But personalities are going to stay with us, aren't they? It's very seldom. Now we can see people try to change in that, you know, in, in what they say around us or how they treat us and so forth. But that personality, it's tough to change a personality. Last Sunday you had 107 people here. You had 107 personalities, and what you can do to pacify is the best you can. Sometimes you just gotta, you just kind of gotta go with it, right? It's a, and that's a good point. I mean, just you know, I think every person is going to have something. Now you got, you have people that are similar that you know that get along, and people that are probably more laid back, and they just uh, you know, and there, and there are personalities that just ultimately they they get along. I mean, that's why they they become friends and they hang out. You know, there are people that we come to worship with that we just naturally get along with. We want we like hanging out with them outside of here. Then there are other ones that. You know, we love them. We come in through those doors and we will shake hands and hug and everything. But outside of here, hanging out, probably not so much. But Doyle nailed it. When we come in through those doors, there's a commonality that we have, aren't there? Those personalities are going to be there. Those personalities may not ever change. But we need to be able to tolerate it and work through it and understand, look, we're working for the same thing. We're here for the very same reason. No matter what personality it is, if you have a strong personality or if someone's just super passive and just doesn't, you know, they don't like confrontation, type A personality will nail confrontation. They'll hit it, you know, they'll hit it straight on. They love it. They don't, it doesn't, doesn't affect them. They're built for that. 
Then there's other people that just don't like it. They just, you know, they're so passive, they just like, okay, whatever, I'll let someone else deal with it. That is more comfortable dealing with confrontation than I am. I don't like it. And those two probably don't get along real well. But when we come in here, we get along for one reason, don't we? Paul's trying to get all these people together. Think of how many personalities that he was dealing with. And he's trying to get all of them together. And that's why when he writes this letter, this was covering all of that. You've got to be long-suffering with one another. You've got to have that patience with one another and deal with it. Do you like that personality? Probably not your favorite thing. But we are in Christ together, and there's a common bond that we share. We're going to be together for a long time. And we're going to be, uh, you know, the, working for the same thing, trying to get people. I mean, those, you know, the people with different personalities, they have families, they have friends, and they want them to get to heaven as much as the one sitting next to them. And so, he's, you know, we've got all of these different things. I mean, there's so many different ways to handle this. Now, does long-suffering mean that we just, uh, you know, that we tol tolerate error? See, I think some things, you know, try to be so, they try to be so loose or they try to be so accepting or tolerant that, well, if someone comes in or, you know, they talk to someone that doesn't have the same faith and there's error that's being taught or believed or practiced, that they say, well, that's just going to be them. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to confront them because I don't like it. I'm afraid that I might <coughs> offend them in some way. Is that what long suffering is? We can't, you know, we cannot tolerate error. I mean, you think of, but you think of what this in, entails and how patient we need to be when that does happen. Think of the prophets. Prophet after prophet that we read about in the Old Testament spoke to the people about the very same thing. In fact, you have a number of different prophets, don't we? We have the major prophets that we, or we consider the major prophets with the longer books. We have the minor prophets that just have the shorter books, but they speaking essentially to the same group of people about the same situations. What did the people do? They listened to him. That's why they went into captivity. They didn't listen to him. And you think of how, how much influence they had back then. Because a lot of these prophets that were talking to the people, that were writing all these different things, we're contemporaries of one another. You know what that means? That it wasn't just this prophet. It wasn't just Jeremiah talking to him. It was Isaiah talking to him as well. It wasn't just Micah talking to them. It was Obadiah talking to them. It was, you know, it was Nahum talking to them. It, you know, it was Joel talking to them. It was Haggai talking to them. It was Habakkuk talking to them. I mean, they, kept, you know, they had all these prophets telling them these things about how to, you know, to make things right. And if they got right, then, you know, then, None of these bad things would happen. And what did the people do? They still didn't, didn't listen to them. And then we saw the consequences, and they went into captivity. But then you look at God. Was God long-suffering with them? Oh, absolutely. He had to be. Can you imagine if God set that time limit on the Israelites? Well, if you're not, you know, by this time, if you're not going to be shaping up, God promised them. He says, you're going to go into captivity. He even told them how long they were going to be in there. 70 years, but he says, I guarantee that it's not going to always be like this. But I want, you know, but he was teaching them a lesson, wasn't he? All that time that they were in that captivity, all that time that they were, they were not able to worship, they were being taught, and it was breaking them down, and it was getting their minds shifting to where it needed to be so that when they finally did get out of that captivity, what's the first thing they did? Rebuilt the walls, they built the altar, they rebuilt the, you know, they rebuilt Jerusalem. They finally learned, you know, they learned sometimes, you know, and it took a long time. Can you imagine that 70, you know, someone told us 70 years, you're gonna go into captivity. 
That is a hard thing to stomach. That's a long time for them to be in that situation. But God was long-suffering. He didn't destroy them, but he taught them. And some people just need longer to you know, to finally convince. But then he goes from long-suffering to forbearing or bearing one another. But how are we bear one another? In love. Now, does love mean, well, I'm unconditional, and I just love you, and I love you enough that you, you, know, you can just do whatever you want, right? That's, you know, that's, the, that's the definition of a lot of the religious world with love. Well, I love you, and I just, you know, and you just go with whatever direction you want because I, you know, I just, you know, and Jesus loves everyone, and Jesus just is going to accept everyone, right? But that's not what love is. In fact, that's probably the opposite of love because we know that there are conditions that get us to heaven. Why? How, you know, how can I love someone and just let them go whatever direction they want to go in, knowing that it could hurt? You know, a parent, when they talk, you know, when they, when they start teaching their children, there are things that are going to hurt kids, aren't there? Things, small children are going to get hurt. They're going to touch that burner. They're going to stick that fork in the light, in the light socket. And uh, those of you who think, oh, who in the world does that? Well, I don't know. I can't imagine who would be that dumb at a young age. I did it. <laughs> I started playing with him. My mom said, don't do that. And just about that time, I shot myself across the room. And, but our parents tell us, don't do certain things because they don't love us? No, because they, do, they don't want us to get hurt. And you think if that's the same thing right here. He, you know, he's telling them before, bear one another, but it's done in love. And when you do something in love, sometimes it's not always what that person wants to hear, but it's sometimes, very often what they need to hear. You bear with them. And that's where enduring comes in with uh, forbearing. You're, it's, it's, the, the definition of this, when you look at it in the original language, is, is essentially to put up with someone. Accept someone. They're going to be like they are. The personality is going to be there. But we bear one another, but we do it in love. Just because you know, a brother takes a lower doesn't mean that we should. Someone does something to us, what do we do? <laughs> Wait until, you know, you, you do something to me, I'm going to come back at you 10 times harder than you ever. You know, is that forbearing one another in love? Right. We need those. I mean, well, sometimes we need those conversations, isn't it? But forbearing one another in love means that we don't retaliate. You do this to me, I'm just going to go after you. You do that, you know, you hurt me, I hurt you. We could retaliate, but we don't. Because we're bearing in, you know, because we're bearing in love. But that doesn't mean we don't need to have that conversation. You're right. They, you know, sometimes we need to have it. Let them know what, you know, that something said that we, you know, that we hurt. But we forbear. You know, that can, I mean, because if we don't have those conversations, what can happen? Won't be resolved. What else can happen? Someone does something to you, and if you don't talk to them, you don't retaliate against them, but if you don't talk to them, what can happen to that relationship? Draw you apart? Resentment? You ever seen that happen? You just, you know, you stay quiet, and all, what does it do? Now it just starts to fester, doesn't it? It starts building it. Jim, did you have something? Well, it also this board throughout the congregation, too, because people are taking sides. Yeah, that's a good point. Not only do you start resenting that person, but you get other people resenting that person. And that other person, then they start... Going, you know, going back the other way, and they're going to push back the other way, and they've got people on their side that they're going to try to get. That happens with the congregation to the elders, doesn't it? Where people will come in, and someone gets, they don't like a decision the elders made, or they don't like it as something that said from the pulpit, or whatever that might be, and they don't say anything, and then it's just presenting, you know, talk to people. Talk to them. You'd be surprised. But don't just, you know, we don't retaliate, but we do, you know, we forbear. 
We do need to talk to people. I want to hit on this. I know we've got uh, just a few minutes. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 16. There's a really good um, example of this, of bearing and not retaliating, not pushing back, not you know, when, when you could, but you don't. 2 Samuel chapter 16, there's a situation where David gets double-crossed by his own son, Absalom. Absalom tries to, you know, tries to take out his father. Uh, you know, he wants, the, he wants the throne, and it forces David, because Absalom gets so many people on his side, David starts to fear for his life, and, he's, and so he flees. And as he's leaving, there's a man named Shimei who starts to run alongside him, and Shimei is throwing every possible, you know, he is, he's cursing him, he's throwing things at him, to David, just, I mean, sandblasting David. There's the second bell right there. I knew we were going to do it. This is going to happen. All right. Next week, we're going to start out with uh, this passage, but we're going to take a look at uh, 2 Samuel, because this is a really good example of what it means to forbear and what it means to, you know, to bear in love and understanding that, you know, we've got God with us, no matter, you know, we, sometimes we have to take it. But God understands where we're at with it. And so next week we'll start we'll, we'll start with the forbearing and taking